may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Turn your attention to the screen. Good morning, family. We are so thankful for you on today. Man, it's Palm Sunday. We're celebrating the Sunday before Easter Sunday, and we can't wait to see what God does on Easter Sunday. I want to remind you, listen, would you continue to invite people for next Sunday? Would you continue to intercede and pray for people on next Sunday? We're praying that God would just do a special move next week as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ at our 8, 10, and 12. Make sure you remember three services next weekend. Find one that works for you and bring somebody with you. I'm so honored today to welcome back to our church one of our sons, Reverend Pastor Sean Taylor. He's the pastor of the Victory Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's the son of our church, served on our staff here, graduate of Dallas Seminary. I am so thankful for him. I had a chance to go and install him when he became pastor over a year ago or so there at Victory Baptist Church. And today he's back home at the Concord Church, him and his wonderful wife, Cecilia. Listen, I love them. We thank God for them. He is God's preacher. He's gifted in so many ways, phenomenal pastor, leader, visionary, scholar, theologian. And I know the Lord will use him to bless our church family on today. So let's warmly receive Pastor Sean Taylor as he comes to share God's word. Pray, Father, that you will now do what preaching in and of itself cannot do by the power of your spirit intersecting with your word. Reach every human heart and bring us to where you want us to be so that as we leave here, we'll leave as walking, talking, visible manifestations of your glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said amen. amen. Well, good morning to you, Concord. It is so good to see you, to Pastor Brian Carter, my pastor, and I celebrate, amen, 20 years. What about that? 20 years, amen. And uh, it's just so good to be with you, me and my wife, Cecilia. Wave your hand, Cecilia. Say, hey, hey, amen. We bring you greetings from Las Vegas, and if you're out there, come and visit us at the Victory Church. We'll be glad to see you if you're able to make it out there. If we see you down at the Strip, uh, We'll, we'll just say you're trying to, trying to win some money for the church. We'll just say that. Amen. But we'll be glad to see you in Vegas if you get out there. Praise God for you. This morning, uh, will you turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4? Jonah chapter 4. I want to talk this morning about lost lives matter. Lost lives matter. Jonah chapter 4, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 11. Again, that's Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. If you have it, say, I got it. All right. Let's read the end of this. It says, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat in the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under the shade until he should see what would become of the city. And now the Lord appointed, everybody say appointed, uh -huh, a plant that made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head uh, to save him from the discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up, the next day, God appointed a worm. Everybody say, appointed. Uh -huh. God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God 
appointed a scorching, everybody say appointed. Uh -huh. God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, and angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pitied the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle, lost lives matter. Lost, yeah, yeah, y'all can sit down, y'all can sit down. That's, that's my, if you ain't too mean, look at your neighbor and say, good morning. The preacher's gonna preach. Lost lives matter. Yeah, in addition to black lives matter, in addition to um, blue lives matter, in addition to wounded lives matter, and add me on the list, in addition to broke lives matter. <laughs> I want to add one more to your list this morning, and it is dear, it's a priority to God. And since it's a priority to God, it ought to be a priority to us. And that is, in addition to blue lives and black lives and all of that, uh, the Bible is going to let us know, especially here in Jonah, that lost lives matter. Matter of fact, the common denominator between blue lives and black lives and whatever lives is, whatever lives you look at, it's lost folk in all of them. I ought to have somebody when I tell you, it's not enough to go back to you black. It's not enough to go back to you blue. It's not enough to go back to your ethnicity. But you need to go all the way back to Adam, created in the image and likeness of God. And as a result of sin, man fell from the glory of God. As a result, every place, every race, every space, no matter what you call yourself, no matter what demographic you may identify yourself with, there are lost people in all of them. And here's what I want to tell you from this text this morning. If lost lives matter to God, then lost lives must matter to us. Now, here's the question. He's going to walk him through, how do I get myself to align with the priorities of God? So he walks Jonah through this process to say, look, if lost lives are going to matter to you like they matter to me, a few things are going to have to take place. First of all, you're going to have to realize God's patience with you. If, life, if lost lives are going to matter to God, matter to you like they matter to God, the first thing is you're going to have to realize, first of all, God's patience to you. Notice the text. The text begins with a but. It displeased no, but then I got to go back. There's a backstory here. Chapter one: Noah, uh, uh, Jonah is disobedient to God. Uh, God tells him to go one way. He goes the next. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He says no to Nineveh. He goes uh, down into the ship, goes down into the sea. God delivers him, brings him up, and say, let me tell you, to begin again, brings him back. And finally, he goes to Nineveh, and the people of Nineveh get saved. And you would think that after all of that, after he's disobeyed, after he's gone down, after God has delivered him, after God has delivered Nineveh, you would think that that's the end of the story. But then we get tacked on chapter 4 because it's not just about saving Jonah from a fish or delivering Nineveh, but he said, okay, now that I've dealt with Nineveh, I need to deal with you. I ought to have somebody here. Uh-huh. Yeah, God doesn't just want to do a work through him, but he needs to do a work on him. And sometimes it's not just the people that we minister to that need some fixing, but it's us, those who go out and spread the gospel. Some of us need some ministering too. God don't just want to work through you. He needs to work on you because there's a funky disposition. 
that Jonah has. And God said, now, nah, now that we dealt with all that, now I need to deal with you. Are y'all in here with me this morning? Now, before we get off on Jonah and start talking about how he has uh, disobeyed God and all that and how he's mad at God because he saved Nineveh, let's, let's just kind of empathize with him, first of all. Uh, out of all the people that you're going to save, God, how dare you? Go and save my worst enemy. And then not only are you going to save my worst enemy, but you're going to use me to do it. Y'all do remember what Nineveh was like, don't you? They, they, they mastered the art of intimidation. These, these were the, the racists of their day. And not only were they terrorists, but when they came to kill you, uh, they are, first of all, they'll cut your legs off. And then not only will they cut your legs off, they'll cut your tongue out. And then they'll cut your hand. And while they're killing you, they'll shake your hand in order to mock you. And not only that, but they'll sever your head. And then not only do they sever your head, but they put your head up on the wall as a trophy. And God, and then then after that, they'll burn you alive. And Jonah is saying, now, out of all the folk that you're going to save, you're going to save these people, and you're going to use me to do it? No, Lord, I'm mad. And you do know that ministry will make you mad sometimes. Because God will send you to folk that don't care about you, and he will send you to folk that you don't care about. And those people that you don't care about, he'll use you to save folk that don't care about you. I don't mind going to the person who always treat me well. I don't mind saving or serving people who always pat me on the back. But I got a problem when God sends me to folk that I can't stand and can't stand me. But you first of all need to, and then he said, you know what? This is why I didn't want to go. But God, this, this, this is why I didn't want to go because I knew that you weren't going to judge them. I knew you weren't going to kill them. I knew that you was going to show mercy. Matter of fact, he says that you're a gracious God and you are relenting and you show mercy and all of that and relent from disaster. Verse 2, he said, I knew you were that kind of God and that's why I didn't want to go because I knew you was going to show them grace. Hold up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jonah, you mad at God because he's gracious? You mad at God because he's compassionate? You upset with God because he's long-suffering? Excuse me, but I think you were the one that benefited before Nineveh did because when you disobeyed God and when you did what you wanted to do and when you found yourself down in the sea and in the belly of the fish, you start crying out to God. And the reason why you here is because God was gracious, he was compassionate, he was long-suffering, and you don't want to give out what you have received? What's up with you, Jonah? You got to appreciate the audacity of this irony. I wish I had somebody in here. He said, no, no, I don't want them to get it. And, and, and so easy. We, we often get that way. We often get that way when we're so focused on somebody else and what they don't deserve and you want God to get them. You ain't got to say amen because they might be sitting next to you, but you just going to nod your head and act like you're reading. <laughs> Sometimes God got to do a change and say, no, you need to realize that God has been patient with you. On, on, on my phone, I got this uh, thing, and I think you got it on your phone too. I got, I, got a, I, got a, I got a camera on my phone. And you know what I can do with this camera? I said, you, I said do you know what I can do with this camera? I can look at everybody up in here. I'm looking all up there in the rafters with folk dog dozing out because they ain't getting enough sleep. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at folk over across the head. I, I can see all y'all. I can see everybody up in here. But you know what? I got a device on this phone that, that after I get through looking at everybody up in here, they got this thing on the phone called, called Swap Camera. And what Swap Camera do when I push that, it take the focus off of you. And now I'm looking at my bald head, and now 
I'm looking at my wrinkles and I'm looking at myself. I wish I had somebody here. Y'all know I ain't talking about no phone. No, y'all know I ain't talking about no phone. What I'm telling you is that when it's come to this faith journey, many of us are like that phone and we like that camera and we looking at everybody else. Ooh, look what she did. Look what he did. I don't know what she find in him and all that. We looking at everybody else, but every now and then, we got to do what Jonah did, what God tell Jonah to do. You need to swap camera and say, it's not my mother and it's not my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing. I wish I had somebody. When I tell you, you got to swap camera and look at yourself. And when you look at yourself, you'll realize that you need the same grace and the same mercy as the person that you're looking at. He found out God not only saves undeserving sinners, but he also sins undeserving servants. Can I do it one more time? And you act like I said nothing, said something. I said, God not only saves undeserving sinners, but he also sins undeserving servants. And some of y'all sitting over here tripping about how God got this person in ministry, how God using this person. If they knew what was in their background, nobody but you. You know, we do all that and we get all shocked and surprised that God used folk with a, with a jacked up background. But let me, let me give you something. Let me give you something to be shocked about. The thing you really need to be shocked about is when you swap camera, you need to be shocked about the fact, first of all, that you still here. And then you need to be shocked that you got saved. And then you need to be shocked that in spite of who you are, God still uses you. And just like he can change you, he got the power to change. I wish I had somebody here that know he can turn a deacon into a dope dealer into a deacon. He can turn a, a pimp into a preacher. He can turn a thug into a theologian. He can turn a crackhead into a choir member. He can turn a pole dancer into a praise dancer. And just like he changed you, he can change somebody else. I hope I'm making sense. Realize God's patience with you. But secondly, if I'm going to align my purpose with God's purpose, lost lives matter to him, lost lives matter to me. Number two, I'm going to have to readjust. You have to readjust your perspective of God. How many of y'all, how many of y'all love God's grace? Raise your hand. Yeah, right. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> if you really think about it, many of us, just like Jonah, notice Jonah ain't got a problem with his holiness here. Jonah doesn't have a problem with God's justice. God, he doesn't have a problem with his sovereignty. In this text, he has a problem. Well, he does have a problem with his sovereignty, but he does have a problem with God's grace. You would think that out of all the attributes of God, the one attribute that we wouldn't have problems with is God's grace. Because God's grace is exceedingly amazing. God's grace is overwhelmingly attractive. But also, God's grace can be utterly offensive. Now, let me tell you why. Why is Jonah tripping? Because, see, he don't mind amazing grace when it's applied to him. But there are two things about grace that we don't like. The first thing about grace we don't like is grace robs you of your bragging rights. All this self-made woman and self-made man, what Grace said is everything that you are and everything that you have and wherever you're going is because of God's grace doing in you and through you and for you what you can't do for yourself. And there's something inside of me that want to brag, but Grace strip you of your bragging right. But not only does that, we don't, we don't like grace because of that, but secondly, like Jonah, we don't like grace because God got a tendency to give grace to folk that we don't want to see them. I wish I had somebody that was honest. And God said, well, let me take you to school, Jonah. I got, let, me, let me take you to my seminary and teach you a few things. And God takes nature and uses nature to teach Jonah a lesson. Do you remember we, we were reading, I told you to talk, to emphasize, he appointed he appointed. So Jonah go back to the east, sit down, and God appoints this, this plant. The plant gives him shade. He now moves from exceedingly mad to exceedingly glad because it's serving him. 
Then the next day, God not only appointed the plant, but then he appoints this uh, worm uh huh. that's going to eat the plant. And then God not only appoints a worm, but then God also appoints a wind that comes and it gets so hot. Imagine it's so hot. The heat on the hottest day in Dallas and then add Las Vegas to it. Do y'all feel that? Uh-huh. And then they get, they get Jonah hot because he mad now. He upset. This is the second time God asked him, do you well to be mad? The first time he asked him, are you mad? Jonah didn't even say nothing. He just walked off. But this time he, he said, you doggone straight I'm mad. Matter of fact, the text going to say he was displeased and he was, it angered him. The word anger there, it means like livid. If you are a Caucasian, if you're black, it means hot as fish grease. Was that enough Hebrew for you? I said, hot as fish grease. Yeah, I'm mad. First of all, you're going to save these folk that's my worst enemy. Then when I try to get some shade, you're going to play around with me, put the shade there, then take it away. Yeah, I'm mad because of what you did to the plant. And then God said, hold up, wait a minute now. Let's talk about this thing. You really, you really concerned about this plant, ain't you? You really feel like I should have done this to you as it relates to this plant. And he said, yeah, I feel like that. He said, well, hold up, hold up. Wait a minute. Uh, first of all, I appointed the plant. Number two, not only did I appoint the plant, but I also appointed the worm. And not only did I appoint the worm, but I also appointed the wind. And while we at it, this ain't the first time I did some appointed. I also appointed that fish that saved you. So the thing that goes throughout the text is saying a point, a point, a point. And that's what God is telling him is, first of all, you need to realize that you ain't running nothing. Everything that I bring or everything I take away belongs to me. The plant belonged to me. The worm belonged to me. The wind belonged to me. The fish belonged to me. Israel belongs to me. Nineveh belongs to me. And you belong to me. And you ain't going to tell me who I can and cannot say because salvation is of the Lord. It don't belong to you. They don't belong to you. They belong to me. Am I making sense in here? That's why, that's why you got to give God your Nineveh list. Now, y'all don't call it a Nineveh list. Y'all call it another kind of list. But since it's Sunday, What's, what's my Nineveh list? My Nineveh list is those people that I got on my list. I don't want God to give them grace. I don't want them to get no mercy. I want them to get exactly what they deserve. Everybody up in here got some kind of Nineveh list. Some of y'all got some Republicans on your list, and some of y'all got some Democrats on your Nineveh list, and some of y'all got some adulterers and fornicators on your list, and some of y'all got some self-righteous church folk on your list, and some of y'all got some hypocrites and liars on your list, and some of y'all got some racists on your list, and some of you got some folk that you left at home this morning, and when you go home... Can I tell you what this text is saying? But he said, I appointed, I appointed, it belongs to me. He's saying, Sean, you ain't got no right to the list. It ain't about you. Those people that's on your list, they don't belong to you. Just like that plant and that worm don't belong to you. So this is what you need to do with your list. You need to take that list and you need to give me that list. Because I can handle your enemies better than you can. And I might just fool around and do for them what I did for you and show them amazing grace. But either way, it ain't your list, it's mine. Not only do I need to realize God's patience with me, gracious, compassionate. Not only do I need to readjust my perspective of God, it belongs to him. They belong to him. I belong to him. And he can do what he please. But finally, you must reconsider God's passion for people. You must realize, reconsider God's passion for people. He engages Jonah. He said, Jonah, you upset about this plant? He said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's talk about this plant and, and why you upset. And he said, and they said, God is saying, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. I'm, I'm going to let you have it. You, okay, I'll engage with you. you. You mad about the plant. But, but let's talk about the plant. Uh, first of all, 
um, this plan that you upset about, you, you didn't create it. You didn't cultivate it. You ain't spent no time with it. It came one day and was gone the next, and you upset about this plan? He said, okay, I'll give you the right to do that. But, but, but here's the argument, Jonah. If, if you can get upset and be concerned about a plant that you didn't create and a plant that you didn't cultivate, how much more do I have the right to care about 120,000 folk who are lost, who, number one, I created, and number two, they were fearfully and wonderfully made, and number three, every breath that they have taken, I have been there, and I've cultivated them. So if you can care about something that you ain't got no relationship, how much more do I I have the right. Matter of fact, Jonah, let's go on to tell you. Let me go on to tell you. Plants are more, people are more important than plants. Let me say that again. People are more important than plants. I said again, people are more important than plants. And let me add animals too, because some of y'all, y'all lick an animal in the face and then walk past a person that won't even say hello. People are more important. This human life, he said, I created in my image. They are worth more than that. And since I care about them, you ought to have a passion for them as well. And as I close, I'm glad that I'm not stuck with Jonah. I'm glad that God gives me, instead of Jonah, he gives me a Jesus. Because Jonah can only take me so far. Jonah can say the wages of sin is death, but I need Jesus to say the gift of God is eternal life. Jonah can say that I'm condemned, but I need Jesus to say there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, Jonah can judge me, but only Jesus can justify me. I wish I had somebody that say, I don't get stuck at Jonah, because Jonah can only take you so far. And Jonah, when he went into the city, he went there and he started whining about himself. But when Jesus went into the city, happy Palm Sunday, happy Palm Sunday, when Jesus went into the city, he didn't whine about himself, but he weeped over the city because lost lives matter. When Jonah went into the city, he wanted God to destroy them. But when Jesus went into the city, he said, I came to seek and to save, not just the black, not just the white, not just the Republican, not just the Democrat, but I came to seek and to save those who were lost. And what you got to realize, brothers and sisters, that God gave you this grace. Not so you can sit on it and have church services on Sunday morning and Bible studies in small groups and enjoy the fellowship. Oh, that's good. But there's some lost people out there. And just like God sent somebody out there for you, you got to go and get somebody else. It's a doggone shame that the people who smoke weed got more sense than church folk. Now, I remember in my weed smoking days, y'all forgive me. <laughs> That was a little unwritten rule we had. We would stop after school and get to the back. We'd get in a circle. Somebody liked the joint. Can I just go and be honest with you? And what we did was we had this rule called Puff Puff Pass. Now, the logic of this rule is that if you got something that's so good, you are not keep it to yourself. Somebody say puff, puff, pass. And for years, the church, we've been puffing a lot. We've been puffing on Sunday morning, and we've been puffing on Sunday school, and we've been puffing on Bible study, and we've been puffing in the choir, and we've been enjoying ourselves. But every now and then, you ought to pass it along and tell somebody that I was seeking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. I was 
thinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters he lifted me safe am I puff puff pass pass it down that he came down pass it down that he healed the sick pass it down that he raised the dead pass it down that he unstopped deaf ears pass it down that he opened blinded eyes pass it down that on a hill called Calvary he died died pass it down that he was buried pass it down that early Sunday morning Sunday morning he got up is there anybody here that got a puff puff hand shake somebody hand and said maybe you don't know like I know what the Lord has done 